Hello, welcome to the Social Exchange Podcast, and thank you for tuning in if you're viewing. I'm here today with author and journalist Mark Pendergrass. Mark, thank you for coming back on the show. Thanks for having me again. We talked last time about one of your books, one of your 14 books that you've written, right? Memory Warp, a book all about debunking psychoanalysis, Freudian psychoanalysis, uh, repressed memories, and then we got into a conversation about a newer book, mm -hmm. and it was just an unserious amount of time to be able to spend on that book. Right. It's, it goes deep. Uh, it is called The Most Hated Man in America, Jerry Sandusky, and the Rush to Judgment. Which, this is it. So, for those who don't know, why don't you tell us, who's Jerry Sandusky, what's he all about, and what's your basis for writing the book? Jerry Sandusky was an assistant coach at Penn State under the very f more famous Joe Paterno. And he worked for him for about 30 years. Uh, he retired in 1999. In the meantime, he had started a children's charity called the Second Mile, sort of like from the Bible, walking the Second Mile, right. uh, to help troubled youth, uh, both boys and girls, but he's most famous for uh, mentoring some of the boys. I don't want to be pedantic. What did trouble youth mean, troubled youth mean in that context? Many of them had been in foster care. Most of them were in single uh, family households. Many of them uh, had been unruly in school, had done very poorly in school. The older ones uh, may have gotten into drugs by the time they were in their early teens. Okay. Um, they, were, they were having trouble in school and they would be referred to the second mile by the guidance counselors quite often. So Sandusky, to, to cut to the chase, he was accused of uh, uh, sexually abusing a lot of these children in the second mile. It was portrayed as that he had started it just so that he would have sort of a, a candy shop of young boys to, to molest. And he was convicted of this in 2012 after a trial. And uh, he's now in prison for the rest of his life unless he gets a new trial. So my book is, I think, quite important because it shows that he may very well be innocent. And it's a controversial book, but as you know because you've read it, I think it's quite a compelling book. And whether people end up concluding that he's innocent, as I have concluded. I was going to ask. Uh, yeah. I, I think he's innocent. Um, I've gotten to know the man fairly well. I've visited him a couple of times in prison, but I've had a lot of correspondence with him. I've gotten to know his wife, Dottie, and his five children. I've uh, interviewed all of them that, that are, remain convinced that he's innocent. The sixth mm -hmm. child, um, they're all adopted, by the way, Right. Uh, flipped on him after he testified under oath during the grand jury that his father never had abused anybody, including him. He was the one that went on Oprah, no less, right? That's right. So he, among many others, uh, went to therapy and unrepressed memories. So the reason that I got interested in this, let me just say this, mm. is that a woman named Glenna Kirker, who deserves a lot of credit, uh, emailed me out of the blue in 2013. She said, I've read your book about uh, repressed memories. Did you know that the Jerry Sandusky case had a lot of testimony based on these very questionable pseudoscientific uh, recovered memory. I said, no, but I know he's guilty. Everybody knows he's guilty because there was a, an eyewitness who saw him uh, sodomizing a child in the shower, a, a young boy. And, you know, there's no way that I'm going to defend somebody like that. And she said, well, that doesn't, that doesn't stand up either. You need to look at this case. Wow. You know, she really impressed you. You didn't know who she was, just no. uh, someone who'd read memory work. No, but she said, you know, he didn't actually see anything. He just heard slapping sounds that he interpreted as sexual. Well, she was right on all counts. So I became, frankly, kind of obsessed with this. I, I, once I dug into it and I began to read the trial transcript and then I began to interview, the first thing I did was to interview Sandusky's children because I figured, look, he's... They're all adopted. They're not even related to him by blood. If he's a pedophile, and, uh, and, and uh, five of these were boys, surely he must have done something to one of them. But they all told me the same thing, with the exception of Matt Sandusky, the one who flipped because of his repressed memories. They all said, Dad is a touchy-feely guy. 
He never molested us in any way. Uh, he's a great guy. And he treated the Second Mile kids like they were extended family. And so he has absolutely no clue about what's politically correct. He has no clue that it's not a good idea to shower with children if you're an adult or to hug them or to do all the things he got or to put it he would put his hand on their knee and squeeze it when he was driving in the car uh, that's what they told me and then you know it's funny I, I, I had two choices about how I should write this book let me just say this I, I concluded that I would do it sort of in the reverse order of, of, of what I would normally do. Normally, if I'm writing a book about somebody, I would write there about them. Uh, you know, right. what, what is this person like? Uh, what have I come to know about them at the beginning of the book? But if I had done that in this book, everybody would have dismissed it and said, oh, come on. Jerry Sandusky being a decent guy, that's ridiculous. What about all those Interesting. Interesting. What about all those people who accused him? So what I did, as you know, is I went through and I very systematically went through every single accusation against him and examined them very closely and basically none of them stand up. Then in the last part of the book, which is called The Real Jerry Sandusky, yeah. I talked about his upbringing. So let's reverse that in this case if you don't mind. Let me tell Please. you a little bit about how he was brought up. Okay, don't let me forget, I have a question for you about his kids, but I'm gonna lock that right here, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, his parents were named Art and Evie Sandusky. Uh, they were, his grandfather came over from Poland, and the real name was Sandeki, but it got changed like a lot of names do. So Art was this great guy, beloved in the town of Washington, Pennsylvania, small little town. And he uh, took over a recreation center when Jerry was, I think, 10 or 11, I can't remember how old, but when he was relatively young. And they moved there. They lived on the second floor of this recreation center, which was called the Brownson House. And his father and his mother were both these wonderful people who would go out and give turkeys to poor people at Thanksgiving and have Christmas gifts for everybody who would take a kid that was in total trouble, a real juvenile delinquent, and turn them around by opening their hearts and their houses to them. And his father had a big sign over his desk saying, you know, something like, I can't remember what it is, something like there's no bad boy, or there, you know, every boy has a possibility of redemption. Okay. So they didn't have their own shower on that second floor. So Sandusky, Jerry, grew up uh, taking showers with men and other boys. Uh, and I interviewed some guy who said that in those days, when he went to the YMCA, uh, everybody swam naked, the, the boys and the men together. So this was a sort of a normal thing. And he grew up horsing around and being sort of a practical joker, throwing water balloons and getting in trouble for it uh, when he was a teenager, things like that. He became very interested in football and was a pretty good football player, and, and he went and played at Penn State. Uh, he wasn't like a star, but he was good. What he mostly was was he was a very good coach. He, he eventually became a coach, as I said, at Penn State, a uh, defensive uh, coordinator. And unlike Paterno, who was a real stickler and a disciplinarian and who yelled and screamed at his players, and many of them absolutely hated him, and, but only later in life said, oh, he, he built my Yeah, character. he had a great rapport with those students, for sure. He did. But he was not totally... Uh, Sandusky was the one who joked around with them and who, was, who got the most out of them by being uh, friendly, not by yelling. You think so? Oh, my pen, my family in Pennsylvania are gonna are gonna hate this right now. Uh, well, there's a book. There's a. I got this mostly from a book by a guy named Joe Posnanski. He wrote a biography called Paterno, which came out not very long ago. Mm. And he said, "Yeah, this is the pattern." And so Sandusky and Paterno did not get along very well together. Uh, Paterno felt that Sandusky was too loosey-goosey with the players and not disciplined enough, and he hated the Second Mile program because it took his focus away. He thought everybody should be completely and totally devoted to Penn State football, period. The Nittany Lions over everybody. And Sandusky, 
was very devoted to the football team, but he was also devoted to the Second Mile program. Anyway, which he started in 1977. And he not only started it, he was very involved with it. He would go in the summer and he would, they would do silly skits. He had a little singing group that uh, he called the Great Pretenders, named after an old 1950s song, but when all these allegations came up, of course, everybody said, ah, oh, the Great Pretenders. Um, <laughs> he wrote a book called Touched, which, yeah. you know, if you're a, if you're a, <laughs> if you're a serial pedophile. Right, in retrospect. I don't think you would name a book Touched, but what he meant was that he had been touched by so many lives of so many people. And, you know, I think that's who he is. I mean, uh, he and Dottie, are deeply uh, 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 Christian. They, uh, they, I, I, they didn't want to talk about their sex life, but I, feel, I felt like I had to ask them about it. Both of them said they had a satisfying and regular sex life up until when they were in their 60s, uh, two or three times a week. Sandusky says, cl claims that uh, she was his only sexual partner, period. That they, uh, only used missionary positions. They, I mean, they're totally the most straight-laced people in the world. They don't like, he never curses. Uh, so it's, it's ironic to me, you know, they looked for pornography on his computer and they didn't find any. Now, it took them two years before they looked at it, so maybe he erased it all or something, but I think that you can tell, you can find it anyway if you're an intelligent person. But he had no pornography anywhere. Uh, whereas the guys who were uh, uh, prosecuting him were sending grotesque, racist, and, and misogynistic pornography to each other, yeah. har, 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 yeah. while they were investigating Sandusky. So there, there are ironies galore in this case. So anyway, that's basically who he is. And I talked to a whole bunch of his friends. Uh, I talked to a lot of the Second Mile kids who did not ever accuse him, and the vast majority didn't. They talked to somewhere like 600 of these uh, Second Mile kids, and they were, I've got police uh, e emails saying, it's so frustrating, we've been interviewing all these kids, they say Sandusky's a great mentor, and, he didn't, and they don't believe these things against him. But that didn't influence the police in any way at all, except to become more frustrated. So some of the things you were saying, I think you're smuggling in so much nuance per the book, but they sound vague as we talk about them now in our half hour that we have. So things like he, you know, his kids thought he was a great guy. He was, yeah, he a rough and tumble guy. He was touchy feely, but never crossed the line. Um, things like that and things like, you know, he had this upbringing. He was just kind of a silly guy. He they had a normal sex life. Couldn't it be that he had some sense of boundaries he had, you know, behavior that was, uh, you know, not okay, but yeah, he had some sense of boundaries. How do you flesh that out? It's entirely possible. I, I don't think so, having gotten to know him for a little bit. You know, I mean, he talked about boundary issues. When he, he had an interview, uh, a prison interview with John Ziegler, who's the other guy who, uh, I have, there's a whole chapter on him in, in my book, who before I did concluded that he thought Sandusky was innocent. And, and that was after he went and, and, and did an interview with him. But in the interview, you know, Sandusky said he thought he had some sort of boundary issues. And I asked him, what did you mean by this? And so did Ziegler. And what he meant was, according to the boundaries that society lays, he had, had issues. He's quite uh, uh, steadfast in saying, you know, I. I'm not sexually attracted to children. There's a very famous interview that Bob Costas did with him yeah. that, that uh, yeah. was used in the trial against him because Costas said, are you sexually attracted to, to boys? And say, instead of saying like you'd expect any, no, anybody who's accused of this would say, no, absolutely not. He said, hmm, sexually attracted to children, hmm. Uh, no, no, I'm not sexually attracted to children. Yeah. It was like, oh my God. But if you think about it, you know, and Ziegler makes this point, you know, that's who Sandusky is. He thinks about everything before he answers it. He's the most painfully honest person I've ever met in my life. Somebody who is this polished pedophile who's gotten away for years with, with abusing all these children would not answer like that. 
you know. How do we know that? You, we, I mean, we can't know. You're making, you're saying that. It would surprise me. Yeah, yeah. I, I interviewed a guy named uh, Fred Berlin. He's a doctor at Johns Hopkins who specializes in the treatment of pedophiles. And one of the things that, uh, that I asked him was, you know, I said, is Sandusky a pedophile because he liked to spend time with children? And he said, not necessarily. It could be. I mean, that could be a terrible indicator. But there are people who like to spend time with children, who want to help children. Um, I said, well, do you know of any uh, serial pedophiles who have maintained their innocence? Because most of them, don't they? It's a good question. Admit it. And he said, yeah, most of them do admit it. They'll rationalize it. Uh, they'll say, oh, it was really love or whatever. Uh, but usually they admit it. I said, I've only had one case where somebody maintained their innocence. And they were innocent. It was a case where DNA uh, cleared them. So that was interesting to me. So, you know, I think what most people hear, and, what, and, you, and it's difficult for them to get beyond it, is this guy took showers with children. Mm -hmm. He hugged them naked in the shower sometimes and said, I'm going to squeeze your guts out. What kind of pervert would do that? And all I can t say is, Jerry Sandusky would do that, and he, I asked him about that. I said, how could you do something like that? He said, well, I wanted to show enthusiasm. These, he used the word enthusiasm a lot. He said, these kids had no childhood, and sometimes maybe I treated them like they were younger than they were because they seemed younger. And he tells a story of a kid that he, you know, had at Christmas who was like 16 years old who's playing with t toys of little children, so excited because he never had these things. So he was trying to be an, an enthusiastic and, and decent person in their lives. He helped them develop better study habits. He would uh, try to, he, he did a lot of stuff for them. Now maybe he did this because he was really uh, sexually attracted to them. I cannot tell you because I can't get inside his mind, but I personally don't think so. Uh, having talked to a lot of these kids, and, and you've, but you've read all this. So at least, let me say this, God bless you for actually reading the book, because so many people form conclusions about it. I was going to say, uh, you get some, uh, very few, but you get these one-star reviews. I've seen them mm -hmm. on Amazon, and I, I read them, and it's like, uh, fine if you want to give it a one-star review, mm -hmm. but you didn't read it. No. I know you didn't read it. No, that person it's didn't It's obvious read it. they didn't read it, for which reason Amazon took them off. Right. They're not there right. anymore. So, so but, uh, so, you know, we're, this stuff does give me the creeps a little bit. It's like, mm -hmm. I get it could be his upbringing, and I get that he could have meant all good and well by it. Yeah. Um, you know, but at the same time, we're, I'm wondering, does he have some boundaries here? Does he have a lack of boundaries? There does have to be a way that an adult behaves and I'm thinking about if I have, if my kid is in that program showering with them, is that the norm that was accepted by all or was that something that should give everybody pause? Then we can get into the, re the, the most damning part of right. uh, your book I mean, soon. It can but. give you pause, you know, it can give you pause. It did not give a lot of coaches who testified for him in a trial any pause. They said, you know, this is the way we all were. This is, you know, yeah, I would, I would shower with kids. It's not, not a big deal. The other thing is, you know, I have a lot of friends who are anthropologists. Yep. Uh, I like anthropology. And so if you look cr at cross-cultural practices and studies, what is completely considered terrible and inappropriate in our culture may not be considered that way as another. This was a 1950s culture that he sort of maintained. His children all called him uh, living in a Mayberry world. Um, that he basically is, was a guileless person. Anyway, that, that's the last part of the book. We should talk, and, and let me just say, let me, let me say this, because I say it over and over again in yep. any of the interviews. Please, whoever wears the camera, read the book. Yep. Re read the entire book, because uh, if you don't, there's no way I'm gonna convince you of anything with this. And, and then you may still have questions, as you do. Yeah, which is fine. Yeah, but I, that is what I wanted to make sure that people understand is that you, that's what I mean by you smuggle nuance into our conversation now. It's very detailed. I mean, you don't miss a beat in this book, so people have to read it. I mean, they just have to read it before they can comment or uh, make wind about it. But let's get into what I said was the most damning right. evidence against your opposition here in writing this book. 
Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about your last book, briefly, Memory Warp, Freudian right. Psychoanalysis, Repressed Memories. What's that all about? That one right there. <laughs> what is that all about and how does that apply to this case? Well, the idea that Freud came up with was that if something horrible happens to you, the worse it was, the more likely you are to forget it, that you would repress yeah. the memory and then you might have it come back to you later in life. I don't think there's anything to this. In fact, it goes against everything we know about how memory does work. We tend to remember the worst things that happen to us, especially if they happen over and over again, yeah. all too well. So, whenever I see a case that involves repressed memory, it raises my antenna. And I did see that with a guy named Dustin Struble, particularly in his testimony. Nobody ever used the word repressed memory during the trial. The defense attorney was completely clueless about it, but it was very obvious to me. He's talking about how, oh, why did you change your testimony? Well, these doors have been opening in my mind, and I had it hidden away in my mind, and now I realize all these things. So he was the only one who allowed me to interview him, and I found him to be a very nice young man, a very sincere young man, who I said, what would you have told me about Jerry Sandusky in 2010 before the police came to you, before you went into therapy, about Jerry Sandusky? He said, I would have said he was a mentor, a great guy, kind of a father figure. I said, well, what would you have told me about abuse? Nothing. I didn't remember any abuse. So I said, well, was this repressed memory therapy? Oh, yes, absolutely. Both of my therapists think I have repressed memories, and I've been remembering them, not yeah. in therapy. He remembers it outside therapy when he's triggered by something, but he's been prepared. It, it didn't really matter whether it's in therapy or not. If somebody tells you all your problems came from being abused, and I suspect it was your father, or I suspect it was your coach, or whatever, uh, you're likely to remember it. There have been some interesting studies in the meantime um, that show that we can induce memories very easily uh, in people. So I guess we don't need to get there, but. That's true. So um, that, uh, that's one case. And, and there, was, there were indications, uh, very strong ones otherwise, that there were repressed memories involved in the case. One of them was the Attorney General, Linda Kelly, after, right after the uh, successful trial against Sandusky, said, you know, something like, it was so hard to unearth these memories from these young men. It was really difficult to, to get Isn't them to say these things. It was amazing. So the That other, didn't mean anything there. That, that really meant, wow, what a good job I did. Yes, they believed in all this <laughs> stuff. The police believed in it. The police would tell people in their interviews, I'm disappointed that you haven't told me anything, or that's good that you told me some little thing like the hand on the knee, but if you remember more, Maybe you'll wake up at three in the morning and you, something will occur to you. Well, that's just not the way memory works. You yeah. remember it or, I mean, you know, there are things that, 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 that you can, you've forgotten and that you remember, but not generally sexual abuse, not, not terrible things. Right. The, the, the other thing that I think we should talk about is the sodomy in the shower thing. Because yes, I was, I was going to bring that up. And, and McQuarrie? Yeah, McQuarrie. Yeah. yeah, Mike McQuarrie was a uh, graduate student at the time, and, but you know, aimed towards being a coach. That's right. the way they get a lot of their free labor at Penn State. Is, uh, and anywhere. And anywhere. Is, Give is, Penn State a break. <laughs> okay, no go. <laughs> so he was working as an assistant coach. He went to put some shoes away one night, which probably was in December, December the 29th of 2000. Um, and uh, he heard slapping sounds. And he says that they lasted about two or three seconds. This wasn't a very long-lasting sound. But he thought they sounded sexual. So when he went into the locker room, he looked in a mirror, and he saw a kid's face. He thought they were about 10. It turns out they were uh, about 14. Looking around the corner of the shower, an arm comes and grabs this kid back. That's what he saw. That's the entirety of what he saw. And then he saw Sandusky and this boy walk out of the shower later. When you say that's what he saw, that's not now what he says he saw. That's right. That's right. But that is what he initially said. Well, that's what he told his father and his father's boss, who's named Dr. Jonathan Drainoff, right. yeah. that night. Because he was very upset. There's no question. He thought Sandusky was having sex with this boy. Yeah. He was really upset. He called his dad. His father said, come right over. We'll talk. 
to you, and and Drainoff, who is the one that I basically seems more trustworthy than anybody else in this because he said the same thing the whole time. He said, but Mike, what did you see? He asked him that three times. But what did you see? And Mike didn't see anything sexual, mm. but he, he thought it was sexual. So for that reason, Drainoff is a mandatory reporter. That means if, right. he, if right. he thinks that there is sexual abuse going on, he legally must tell the police. He did not do that. He did not do that because he didn't think that it's, it was sexual. It sounded like maybe Sandusky was just horsing around with a kid, which is, in fact, what he was doing. Uh, so 10 years later, uh, when the police come and they've heard that McQuarrie had seen something or heard something, they heard something about him, McQuarrie changed his memory. But, and that's not unusual, 10 years after an event, for people to change their memory, particularly if it's influenced by somebody saying, we know Sandusky is an evil molester, you were absolutely right back then, et cetera. And so now he uh, remembers seeing into the shower and, and, and that story that uh, everybody has heard. But that's not what he saw. Now the other interesting thing about this is, I know who the young man was in that shower because he came forward, right. his name is Alan Myers, he came forward to say, I was the kid in the shower after this whole story blew up in November of 2011. And he said, Sandusky never touched me. He was a mentor to me. I had him uh, stand up for me at my uh, senior football day as, instead of my father. Uh, I lived with the Sanduskys uh, for several months uh, after I graduated from college, I think. Uh, I drove hours to go to his mother's funeral to show my support for him. He's been nothing but a great guy. The only people he was angry at were the police because the police had tried over and over again to get him to say something and he felt yeah. pressured. Yeah. Well, so then guess what? Two weeks later, Alan Myers, who has a DUI that he's facing, has a lawyer named uh, Andrew Shubin, who turns out to sort of like be the main lawyer representing lots of these Sandusky victims. He gets Alan Myers to say, oh no, I was abused. And I think he probably sent him to therapy because he sent almost everybody to therapy yeah. to help him remember things. Nobody ever called Alan Myers to testify because the prosecution was afraid because he'd given this incredibly strong statement. The defense was afraid because he'd flipped. So the entire case is like that. It's just a house of cards. Yeah, and you go through it pretty well and each case be damned. I mean, really, there is no good evidence in, in each one of these uh, witnesses. I do want to go through, though, a timeline from the 90s and see what you make of it. So we have, just real quick, because I can't believe we're almost out of time. I guess this, that's what happens when we try to get into this territory. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, hey, what we're going to do. So I have, okay, 94, um, a person we call victim number seven reports inappropriate contact in the showers. Uh, no, you can no, correct no. me if I'm wrong. D number seven is Dustin Struble, and That's he Dustin didn't Struble. report anything. Ninety-eight is the first time that any kind of oh right okay so happened. in the in the earlier nineties these are ostensible memories of contact happening. Is is that right, or am I getting am I totally missing up dates here? It could be that they were saying, oh, this happened when I was a second miler in nineteen. Okay, Let, let's That's get right. let's let's get on to. So in, in 98 that happened, 98, the university police investigated. Uh, June 1st, university police interviewed Sandusky. No charges were filed. 99, Sandusky retired from his right. job as a defensive coordinator. Um, and it was suggested to him that he stop using facilities. Not uh, then. Disengage. Not then, no. When he, w when he retired in 1999, yeah. he was given emeritus status, yeah. and he had a key to the Penn State locker rooms. He had right. an office on the Penn State campus. Right. So that was fine. He had had this incident in 1998, which turns out to be uh, the, the first such uh, time that anybody said anything. And it was a mother who was upset that Sandusky had been showering alone with her kid, whose name was Zachary Constance. Yep. And so they interviewed him the next day, and he said, no, nothing ever happened. He didn't do anything to me, um, period. So they dismissed the case. They also had they tried to do a sting operation, but, you know, that amounted to nothing. So it should have been dismissed. Oddly, Constance never 
remembered. He went to therapy, but he never could come up with something. But right. they still found him guilty in that case. He because he supposedly was grooming him. He wanted to have sex with him. Anyway, the 1998 case didn't amount to anything. Then in 2000, the McQuarrie incident. That's yeah. when they said to him, "Don't shower with kids anymore." And that's what got everybody in trouble. That's what, uh, why uh, the college president, uh, Graham Spanier, eventually got fired and, and uh, is facing prison time. Yeah. And Tim Curley and Gary Schultz, the administrators, et cetera, they all concluded that Sandusky had been horsing around the shower, which was true. Right. But instead of turning him into the police, they said, look, it's just not a good idea for you to bring kids in, uh, to the Penn State campus. And so he, he didn't. That was the end of that. We've got so little time, I wanted to get to so much more, sorry. sorry. I'm, I'm but I do want to, no, you know what we should do, if you're up for it, let's yeah. do a longer audio version of this podcast so that we can do a uh, time frame of our leisure, if you have the time. Oh, I'm um, glad to do that. So let me just ask you this. This is what I call, it's, this podcast is called The Social Exchange. Right. And it's almost, I, I hate to call it the ante for being on the show, is to do this segment, which I call uh, the charity segment. Can you reserve a room in your mind to paint the most absolutely charitable, realistic view of your opposition in this case. Someone who would say, I think Sandusky's guilty, man. Maybe they even agree with you about repressed memory. What are some good arguments on that side of the aisle? Sure. I mean, they could say, well, look at Brett House. He, uh, yes, his father did call uh, the uh, lawyer for him and get him to contact him. And no, he wouldn't talk to the police initially. But when he finally did talk to the police, and yes, the police used leading methods with him, but he still started to say some pretty bad things about Sandusky initially. And what about uh, Michael Kajak, another victim, who said uh, uh, the very first time he talked to the police that some bad things had happened. And he, as far as I know, hadn't been in therapy. So what about all these things, Mark? Mm -hmm. That's what they could say. So. This is, um, I know you've read this top to bottom probably more than once, Jim Clemente's analysis of the situation, uh, FBI. Here's just a quote uh, from that 100 page or so report that was an analysis right. that was um, requested by the Paterno family actually, I believe, is that right? That's right. Okay, so the quote is, this case is a textbook example of how people in the general public misinterpret the behavior of child sex offenders. And Jerry Sandusky is a textbook example of a preferential uh, child sex offender and a nice guy, acquaintance offender. He effectively groomed most of the people who came in contact with him, including child care experts, psychologists, professionals, celebrities, athletes, coaches, friends, and family. The sad truth is that people do not recognize the, quote, grooming behavior of, quote, nice guy acquaintances, offenders, especially when they know or are close to that person. What do you make of that? Well, Jim Clemente has his sort of little one-box way of looking at everything. Um, there are, quote, nice guy offenders. But as I pointed out, if Jesus came back, Jim Clemente would think he was a nice guy offender. You know, <laughs> uh, suffer the little children to come unto me. Look at this guy who's spent, choosing to spend all this time with children. Well, I may just have been. Um, I don't think so. <laughs> Please, let's not go there. Okay, sorry, that was uh, me. That was not, that was not Mark Pender. <laughs> the opinions of this segment are my own. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I don't buy it. And uh, I, again, I, I did, uh, uh, you know, I talked to Clemente, but I also talked to Fred Berlin, and I agree with him much more. He said, yeah, yeah. I mean, there are, there are people who become coaches or elementary school teachers or... Uh, in other, you know, choose occupations, priests who choose it because it will let them spend a lot of time with children and they are sexually attracted to them and they're pedophiles. Yeah, yeah. That's true, but that doesn't mean that if you choose to spend time with children and you're an elementary school teacher right. or a priest that you're a pedophile. The so. old correlation causation problem, you know. Yeah, exactly. Let's end here. I was talking to you at the beginning of the segment, or actually before it started, that I read this in two different spaces. I feel like two different people reading the book. On one hand, everything you say about repressed memory, it, it's just so right on. You go with every single detail and explain how there was not much wiggle room for something else other than a, a planted repressed memory to have happened in a lot of these cases. So on the other hand, so that makes me think at least this guy would deserve a, another trial or this was a, a at you the know, minimum, unscrupulous he trial. Yeah. The other thing I started to think about is um, all the stuff we were talking about at the beginning. Was his behavior questionable enough that uh, 
if this trial could have happened again and been more scrupulous, uh, would something have come of it and would something just have come of it? W well, what's justice in your mind at the end of the day? Sorry. Well, I, as I've told you, I think justice at the end of the day is that he should be freed. I don't think he did anything. But that's up to a jury. And 12 men, especially 12 men and women, especially uh, in cases of sexual abuse allegations, they can be emotionally swayed even when the facts don't necessarily uh, sure. okay. uh, sway them. So people are found, innocent people are found guilty quite frequently, we know now, because of the DNA exonerations. And they're usually in highly emotional cases of mm. uh, sex abuse or murder. Um, so I don't know how another trial would come out. I can't tell you that. But he deserves another trial. There's no question about that. So I'm sorry to people in the control room. Thank you so much for letting us go a little longer. Uh, you're just too interesting to wrap <laughs> up in a half hour. So you speak to Sandusky, not only have spoken to, but are somewhat in contact with him. And where he was left off, he was in uh, solitary confinement for almost 24, I mean, what is it, like 23 hours a day? That's right. And so how is he holding up now? Sorry we didn't get to talk about Jerry Sandusky no. as the person too much, but. Well, it's interesting because I asked him to write something about what his life in prison was like. Yeah. And he did. And I quoted from it fairly extensively in a chapter in the book called Enduring Prison. Yeah. It's horrible. I mean, I think we could go on and on about solitary confinement. I think it's a form of torture. I don't think anyone should be in solitary. In general, yeah. And there are 80,000 80, people or so in solitary confinement now in the United States. And I'll say that a lot of what this book is about is not just about Sandusky, but about the way the perils of our justice system and of the way the media works and of how a moral panic can blow up. At any rate, thank goodness he has now been moved. Yeah. First he was in uh, SCI Green, which was a maximum security prison where a lot of people were on death row. And they were right to keep him in solitary confinement there probably because he might have been killed. Now, thank goodness, he is in SCI Laurel, which is a, a level two facility. He's not in uh, uh, solitary anymore. This is just very recent. This is in the last couple of weeks, I think, that they moved him. And I'd like to think it had something to do with my book because it was so damning what I'd written. But now he uh, has uh, like seven roommates. He lives in a sort of a pod of uh, different rooms where he can walk around. Before, every time he was taken to, quote, yard, which is exercise, which yeah. is very important for him, he, he, ha he exercises all the time. It's amazing to me, by the way, that he was so resilient that he survived this. In fact, it, many people become severely mentally ill or give up uh, under such circumstances, and he hasn't. And uh, so whether you think he's guilty or not, he certainly has fortitude. Um, now they no longer, uh, you know, put handcuffs on him every time he goes to yard and look up his anus to make sure nothing is in it. I mean, it's the most demeaning thing you can imagine what they do to these people. So you might read the book and decide, all right, he is guilty after all. You might read it and say, just give it a little more thought. You might read it and think, man, guilty or not, this guy shouldn't be in prison. But I just encourage everybody, definitely read the book. All right, so before I, I hate... Can I, can I do one more thing? Go can ahead. One more yeah. thing? Yeah, let's reading. do it. The book has been blackballed in the Pennsylvania press. You're going there. And it just really, uh, it, it's very, very irritating. The Associated Press reporter yeah. who writes about the Sandusky case yeah. won't write about it. I mean, he's got a copy of the book. He won't read it. Um, the uh, sports reporter, even at the Washington Post, who wrote a very long article about Sandusky, I had sent him the book. He didn't read it. Um, so in general, but particularly in Pennsylvania, as I think you know, uh, uh, they simply won't touch it. Yeah. They, and, you know, I've got many, many, many facts in here that we have not talked about. We haven't talked about the janitor uh, who supposedly saw him abusing somebody who said, no, that wasn't Sandusky abusing me, him. Uh, so anyway, it's, it's maddening to me. I, as you said, I've written uh, a lot of books, and most of them have been reviewed in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, not this book. 
Yeah. Uh, it's being blackballed. So I hope somebody will watch this and decide to re actually write a review of the book. It's, it's gotten two great reviews, one in Skeptic Magazine by Frederick Cruz and one in the New York Journal of Books, which is online by Marilyn Gates. And, and so Jerry Coyne, too. Uh, didn't he review it? Not really, no, not a real review. He wrote a little note about why people should not hate it or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. It's gotten, the back so, it's gotten okay. some coverage. Well, I will just say I don't mind sharing my opinion, which is that I started off reading this um, absolutely convinced that he's guilty. Mm -hmm. Your book gave me more than pause. I happen to think he probably isn't guilty. Mm -hmm. I do, I always wonder about his behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, it's questionable, but what I've noticed is that. After reading your book, I now look at past press, you know, releases and stories. It was really one-sided, and it really was uh, absent of factual basis. So again, I hope people do read the book. The book is called "The Most Hated Man in America: Jerry Sandusky and the Rush to Judgment." My guest today was Mark Pendergrass. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Thanks, Zach. See you guys.